Good evening. I hope you have had a wonderful day so far, based on, on, on the very um, invigorating discussions that we have had, which is a big promise for tomorrow and, and uh, many other days to come. I'm uh, Sharsad Mojab from University of Toronto and the editor of this book that we are launching here uh, called Marxism and Feminism. I'm standing in front of you with much humility based on, on the fact that I know a lot of you for many, many years and knew you through meeting you in between the, the covers of the books, journals, or on the cover of, of many books. A lot of you here have been my mentor, and I've learned greatly from you. The humility is the, on the fact that I feel that as an internationalist feminist, my responsibility and duty to acknowledge those women that came before me many, many years of work, and especially two of, of my big mentors here, Figa Hug and Cynthia Coburn. I followed a lot of you in the last few decades on internet, email exchanges, ideas, and it is also wonderful to meet you here. So I think that by saying this, what I would like to bring to your attention, that this book that I've edited is a modest step towards a very big project ahead of us. It's a modest step to acknowledge of the work that has been done decades before, but also the important and, and, and the big responsibility that we have in, in terms of, of reopening and, and um, regenerating the ideas of Marxism and feminism as a very impor important project for rebuilding international feminist movement. Um, a lot of you, you may not know, but if you look at the book in the list of, of the recommended readings, some of the panelists here, presenters, are all there. You can look at the names and it is very similar to the names of, of, of the conference participants. And then also I've created a website that again you can follow all this massive important literature which is a contribution of, of the work of, of many feminist um, scholars and, and theoreticians. But I also want to acknowledge that it's about a decade. This book is, is the actual work of, of, of a, almost a decade. And part of it, and the most important component of it, is, is based on, on the rereading through reading groups in North America and in Europe, with activists especially, with feminists and, 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 and women activists, that desire a world better than what we have and, and a world that we all deserve. Those reading groups, they gave me a lot of hopes and, and pushed my own theoretical and, and, and practical political thinking. And um, I would like to acknowledge all those many, many hours of, of sitting together, debating and discussing as if the world matters. Then, uh, when I finished editing with my colleague Sarah Carpenter, the book which is called Educating from Marx, Race, Gender, and Learning. As soon as that book finished, the final epilogue of that book is called Living, Re uh, Living Revolution, Reading Re Revolution, and Dreaming of Revolution, which is a summary, is, 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 is in a way sums up, up uh, my own autobiographical um, way of, of being in this world. I continued that tradition as a way of entering into this book. So I say autobiographical, but it is not identity-based autobiography. It is actually very political, 
um, autobiography because I put myself as a political agent in this world. It's not about my voice, it's not about agency, it's not about representation. It's about a political project. Because this book is, is, a, is a sort of a conversation with the post-structuralist, post-modernist, feminist that derailed a lot of, of, of our uh, revolutionary desires. In that process, what we talked about was, was that if we want to rebuild a very strong international feminist movement, what are the key concepts that we need to revisit and come back to? That's why that as part of, of the reading group that we had, we called the project Keywords Project. And uh, we read, we, we came up the, with, with different concepts and it started um, collecting literature and information around those key concepts and then reading them, and then invited the scholars um, to contribute um, on, on, on the basis of, of, of the uh, assigning or, or their choice of, of a keyword. The idea was, was that Im imagining a young reader, a young feminist of today, that for some of us that are teaching courses, they would like to get the history of that particular concept from a Marxist perspective, understanding it from the feminist perspective, and then also understanding it today. How to pick it up, where to go with it, what kind of, of, of the literature is, is needed for that. Let me read to you a very limited list, but also very important list of concepts that we came up with. And by doing so, I will also acknowledge the authors that have contributed to this book. And it is, we organized it simply based on, on, on the alphabetical order of the concept that we picked up. So the concept of democracy is written by Sarah Carpenter, financialization by Jamie Magnuson, ideology by Himani Banerjee, imperialism and, and primitive accumulation, Judith Whitehead, intersectionality, Delia Aguilar, labor power, Helen Coley, nation nationalism, Amir Hassanpur, patriarchy, patriarchies, Kumkum Sangari, and reproduction, Michelle Murphy, revolution, Mariam Jazairi, standpoint theory, Cynthia Coburn, gender after class, Teresa Ebert as the epilogue for the book. But we needed to have some kind of, of, of the sort of conceptualization of all the debates and the history. And as a result, with permission and contribution of a free gahak uh, that I invited to contribute to this book, um, two important pieces by Friga um, on gender relations and the marks within feminism is included in, in the book as a sort of, of, of the opening of contextualizing the whole project. A very important piece, which is related to the discussion that we had just uh, earlier this afternoon, um, is written by Hemani Banerjee as part of that contextualization, which is called Building from Marx, Reflections on Race, Gender, and Class, which is pushing us and, and urging us to get more sophisticated and com complex way of, of understanding of this relationship beyond intersectionality. And, and also centering the question of colonialism racism, imperialism, as connected to the project of, of the capitalist accumulation globally. So, I would like to call upon younger generation among us today here. Um, by picking up this book, it's a call for you to move forward. This is the beginning, this is sort of, a, of, I would like you to see that this book is an end of a beginning. 
an end of a beginning in, in the sense that there are many, many keywords or concepts that are not included in, in, in this book. It was just was, was beyond this project. It would have turned into the encyclopedia um, effort that Free Guys is doing, and we didn't want to do that. In order, and, and, and I will ask the um, younger scholars to do that in order to engage with this book, debate it, critiquing it, show us the, where, where are, are, are the limits and, and, and possibilities, but also the potentials that they see in, in this book. The other thing is, is, is that, is that um, something that it is very important for me is, is the effort of the women feminist scholars that are coming from the range of, of backgrounds, women from different par parts of the world, that for the first time, very seriously and, and, and uh, earnestly um, engaging with Marx's ideas. So this theorization is a very important step in, in terms of not only the feminist engagement or interaction with, with Marxism, but also feministness thinkers that are engaging seriously, rereading and resynthesizing Marx as well, which is very important. So one of the things is that I do, and, and a lot of my, of my students, again, they know you all, because you all, most of, of you, appear on, on the reading list for my courses on from um, ranging from women and revolution in the Middle East to women war, war and learning or uh, women migration and, and work. I think you can you recognize who is listed in, in what course. And I think that um, I hope that you will also look at um, this book um, in a way of, of, of bringing it to the attention of your students and, and your um, discussions. I want to also acknowledge something else here, which is years ago, um, I joined, I think that it was in, in the 90s, I joined Nira Yuval Davis and, and Cynthia Coburn in a um, network, international ne network of women um, in conflict zones network, which deeply influenced my work in, in terms of, of, of the, the war in, in the Middle East and, and the impact of it on, on women throughout the Middle East. But most importantly, and again, this is related to some of the discussion that we had earlier in terms of, of, of Cynthia's articulation on, on a standpoint theory, and, and um, also the discussion on, on race and on capitalism. Participating in that network helped me the, to be sort of, of, of theoretically um, aware and have the lens that Liz, Len, uh, Liz was, was, was talking about in terms of, of, of following the imperialist reconstruction, quote-unquote reconstruction of, of, of the uh, war zones of, of the Middle East. And the way that, again, I benefited from reading uh, Hester Eisenstein's Feminism Seduced that um, how this part of, of, of the imperialist project of so-called so post-war reconstruction was fragmentation, depoliticization, NGOization of, of the women's movement. And, and, and some of these ideas are also covered in this book. I'm saying that, and I'm, I'm sort of in, invoking that experience of, of networking as a way of, of, of uh, remind, reminding ourselves of the importance of, of breaking this isolation of theorization of, of feminism and, and, and reimagining networks of, of, of um, feminist thinkers with the ideas of, of understanding of, of the issue of, of gender relations capitalism, imperialism, and, and very important collusion of two forces that are 
I would say that they have uh, embarked upon a serious war on women globally. And then that is the forces of imperialism and fundamentalism. That is what is that we need to uh, sort of address. Uh, with these very brief remarks, I would like to invite uh, Cynthia Coburn um, to talk about her chapter. A lot of, of the authors that have contributed are not here. So Cynthia and Friga agreed to talk about their contribution. And I have a statement that Teresa Ebert wrote that I will share with you after their presentation. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, is that all right? Are we there? Okay, look, this is terrible, well, terrible. Well, no, first of all, let me say, I am so proud, I'm s I so respect Shahzab's work on this book. She has worked so hard on it, and the skill that she's put in it, conceptual, but also pushing the publishers and chivying the writers and one thing or another is fantastic. I am really proud to be in a, in a volume with Frigga, and with all the other women who are there. There's something in this digital age that is still very nice about a book, isn't there? You know, I'm proud of it. So thank you. Um, this is a bit tricky for me because actually it's exactly the same subject that I talked to you about before. So I'm going to have to cut a few corners, right? Um, what I'm going to mainly answer is Shahzad's question to me, um, what's in this for young women? Okay. But first of all, let me just say, her first question to me was, why choose standpoint as my topic? Okay, I think there are two, impo two important sources of value in Marxism for women, for feminists and for feminism. One is a body of theory about economics, the mode of production, into which we can and must insert women, women's labor, paid and unpaid, because very largely Marx and subsequent Marxists did fail to do this. The overall understanding of the capitalist mode of production can be improved and deepened by that insertion. And besides, feminist theory can be improved and deepened by analyzing women's economic lives, see ourselves producing exchange and use values in the workplace and at home through the lens of Marxist theory. But that's not where I'm coming from in my contribution to this book. So why the choice of standpoint? That reflects a second source of value that I see for us in Marxism. Apart from the substance, there is method. Neat methods, yeah? Some of the conceptual approaches in dialectical materialism, the ways of thinking which Marxists use to understand class relations and systemic class power, can, I think, usefully be adopted and adapted, transferred, put to use in understanding systemic male power. Right, I'm going to cut out a lot of this because I said it this, this afternoon and I'm sure you were all here, okay. I'm going to jump to, right, the question, what can it say to a younger generation of feminists? How would we like to see the younger generation of women engage with this, this book, with the ideas of Marxism and feminism, hyphenated? I do have a very urgent wish about this, because I think something very odd and worrying is happening, in England, at any rate. It's really two sides of a single coin, two traditions of feminist thought are failing to embrace each other. Now, I feel sad, sad, but also a little bit guilty in telling you this story because these are movements, both of which I belong to, and I love them, okay? But I think we have to be brave and say where things are not coming together, and that's what I'm going to try and do. So any of you here 
from England, don't be hurt by this because it hurts me just as much as it hurts you. Okay. Right. On the one side, we have a very energetic young feminist movement, in London anyway, and I think around the country. It began its rapid growth maybe eight or nine years ago, and it's impressive in its size. More than a thousand women turn out to the annual Feminism in London conference. There are several groups in the new movement. The Feminist London Network is perhaps the biggest and boldest. There's Rad Femme, UK Feminista, the F word. But their combined scope, the themes that, they're dealt, that are dealt with in their blogs online, which I check out all the time, show this contemporary movement to be curiously narrow, a narrow kind of feminism. It is almost entirely limited to body politics, to pornography, prostitution, commodification, male violence, LGBT issues, equality features as well, and there's some welcome anti-racist thinking. Okay? But for example, when they t tear themselves to pieces, this new young movement that I like to feel part of, it's, it's not on questions of socialism or s relationship to socialism. It's mainly on prostitution. Do we call it sex work and support sex workers unions or do we call it prostitution and ban it? And they will not allow each other on each other's platforms, you know? There's, I wanted a speaker at a conference and she wasn't allowed because she has the wrong view on prostitution. Can we afford this? Anyway, so that's, that's my sad, heartfelt, regretful critique of contemporary feminism in London. But, yeah, what I'm saying is that the words socialism, Marxism, or even capitalism don't feature in its discussions and events. Some of us older ones who became feminists in the 60s and 70s and 80s in a socialist as well as a feminist tradition, we do try to engage in and with this contemporary young feminist movement. I think that the characteristic age is around 25, 26. Okay. We try to interest them in seeing how capitalism, neo-global, neoliberal global capitalism affects them and calls for a unified feminist and socialist analysis as a system. The capitalist system in relation to a patriarchal sex gender system. A few of us offer workshops at the Feminism in London conference. Edge's here, she's engaged in this very energetically. Um, on these themes, we try to engage women's, women's interest in them, but it's slow going. It is not catching on like wildfire, I tell you. Okay. Now, at the same time, and here my grief again is showing, I'm worried by an, ex an exactly converse problem. Those of us, mainly older women, who continue to think of ourselves as socialists, as socialist feminists, are not good at keeping hold of the body politics. Our analysis involves a critique of the left, left parties, left, left organizations, and some of us aspire to enter them and to work with men in them. But the issues we address in this context are almost always and exclusively economic issues framed as exploitations and oppressions arising in the capitalist mode of production, as analyzed from a woman's standpoint, women's low pay and unequal pay, their unrewarded domestic labor, their manipulation as consumers, their positioning as clients of state services. Yes to all that, yes, but, but what we fail to take in with us as we approach socialist organizations, what we do not challenge socialists about is radical feminist issues. The issues that women have in their lives as mothers, daughters, wives, lovers, sex objects, sisters, punch, punch bags, and domestic and sexual service providers to men. We drop all that at the door as we go in to socialism. In fact, the very issues that the young generation of feminists are obsessed by we are still very shy indeed of talking about patriarchy, the male dominant sex gender order, in the context of socialist organizations and movements. And I just want to mention two conferences which are contrasted in this way. 
I'm thinking, first of all, of a conference among socialist feminists that took part in, place in London about two years ago and attracted a lot of London socialist feminist women and a few men of the left. Right. And I want to compare that with a conference organized by the Turkish Socialist Feminist Collective. Many of the 200 or more women who came to that Turkish meeting had been attracted by the presence of Heidi Hartman as a keynote speaker. speaker. Hartman is remembered, as we were saying earlier the, today, for her work, um, Dual Systems, theorizing of patriarchy and capitalism, the mutual shaping of the capitalist mode of production and patriarchy. Interestingly, at that meeting, she expressed re regret for her lack of attention to male violence in her former analysis, and I think that's quite interesting. Okay. Now, many of the thoughts expressed by the Turkish socialist feminists in that discussion in Istanbul were in striking contrast to the discussion that followed the socialist feminist conference in London, where interventions, frequently by men, tended to be from and about the left rather than about feminism. Now, a young woman called Yasmin, for instance, in the Turkish conference, remembered how in the Turkish socialist feminist movement, quote, from the very first day, women's labor has been on our agenda, but we never separated the issue of women's labor from the politics of women's body, always making a point of approaching all feminist issues as part of a totality. Recently, she said they had started a campaign titled, We Want Our Due Back From Men. Men, she said, have a material interest in women doing the cleaning, the cooking, and taking care of the elderly, and most importantly, of children. Edje, who's here, who thinks and writes from a Marxist perspective, nonetheless stressed that the, radical, the radicalism of feminist politics does not depend on how much anti-capitalist it is, but how anti-patriarchal it is. And I agree with that. A young woman called Meric and another called Gulnar noted a startling increase in murders of women in Turkey. 1,400% increase in nine years. <coughs> they analyzed this explicitly as an effect of both patriarchy and capitalism. Meric said that she saw economic change as giving more women independent incomes with the result that they are less prone to obey men. Meanwhile, unemployment has cost me some men their status in the male hierarchy, and their resentment precipitates violence against women. Gulnur believed that Turkish women are experiencing a dual oppression, one both, both by neoliberal and familialist conservative methods. Serpil suggested that Turkish women are witnessing, quote, a collaboration between patriarchy and capitalism, such that Capital has made a leap into a multifaceted, multidimensional exploitation system. Thus, the surge in misogyny calls for an analysis both of the capitalist developments and the societal impact of feminist critiques of male power. Okay, so, Serpil again said, we can see that we are badly battered, both by capitalism and by men. We need a holistic perspective against men and against capitalism. Why is a systematic analysis admissible for the mode of production, but not for the sex gender order? Okay, um, I just think those young women in Turkey are doing great work and we can learn a lot from them. That's why I quoted them at length. Surely the terms of our partnership with male Marxists and socialists are that they should take on the theory. Men's and women's lives and relationships are structured and deformed by patriarchy, the male dominant sex gender order, as well as and in conjunction with capitalism, the economic system. Don't they see it, the feminist analysis? The men, do they not get it? Won't they take ownership of it? Won't they deepen and enrich their socialist analysis and allow it to precipitate them into feminist socialist and anti-patriarchal activism as men? Now try, try saying that to the Socialist Workers' Party in London. Just try. Okay. To me, what we socialist feminists take towards the left is a culturally self-policed and edited version of feminism. It's as though we women enter the room of socialism self-disarmed, voluntarily dropping 
the anti-patriarchal part of our feminist critique at the door. It seems kind of rude, you know. I would like to see the energy and anger of the radical feminist revival linked to and mutually shaping and empowering the Marxist feminist revival. Thank you for listening. Weil ich schon ganz müde bin und außerdem gehorsam, darf ich Deutsch sprechen und ihr kriegt das übersetzt. Ich wollte das natürlich auf Englisch machen, aber ich fühle mich jetzt zu müde dafür. Und außerdem bin ich gehorsam, weil Shahzad gebeten hat, dass wir in weniger als zehn Minuten über unseren Beitrag in dem Buch sprechen. Das versuche ich jetzt. Davor als Vorspann ganz kurz, Shazad und, und wir irgendwie oder ich und mehrere, es ist immer eine kollektive Bewegung, nicht einzelne Personen, arbeiten schon über ein Jahr daran, wie können wir uns endlich treffen und können zusammenarbeiten und dem doch so notwendigen marxistischen Feminismus einen richtigen Schwung geben. Es ist jetzt an der Zeit und es ist weltweit im Aufbruch. Warum machen wir nicht irgendwie einen Weltkongress, ihr seid in ihm jetzt und gefordert, diesen Aufbruch mitzumachen? Die drei Fragen oder voranzutreiben. Die drei Fragen von, von Schauser. Das erste ist, warum das Stichwort? Ich habe ja zwei da drin, das habt ihr schon gehört. Das erste ist Gender Relations, von, über das ich heute Morgen ganz knapp auch gesprochen habe, weil ihr das wirklich nachlesen könnt. Vielleicht noch ein Element dazu. Das hat bei mir auch, glaube ich, 15, 15 Jahre wenigstens gebraucht, bis ich auf, auf diese Idee mit Gender Relations sind Relations of Production gekommen bin. Davor ist diese ganz lange Zeit, wo man immer hin und her überlegt, ist, ist Frauen das wirkliche richtige Subjekt? Nein, da sind ja die schwarzen Frauen aus, ist weit, mittelklasse auch. Wir müssen Frauen beiseite lassen, wir müssen Gender sagen, aber Gender als Deutsche zu sagen, das ist wie wenn man immer mit Zahnstochern rumläuft oder so. Die Sprache kommt nicht auf den Leib. Gender ist irgendwas ne, im Labor erfunden geht irgendwie auch nicht. Dann diese unendliche lange Diskussion darüber auf der Suche, wie kommt es eigentlich, wir wussten sofort, dass die Frauenunterdrückung sehr viel älter ist als der Kapitalismus, aber wieso bleibt sie im Kapitalismus, wo doch der, der große Leveler ist, alle sind gleich, aus denen man Profit ziehen kann. Warum denn dann immer weiter Frauenunterdrückung? Wie ist das? Und da drin diese schrecklichen Diskussionen mit Haupt- und Nebenwiderspruch und dann die merkwürdigen Diskussionen. Wer ist eigentlich der Hauptunterdrücker? Ist es der Kapitalismus? Ist es der Mann? Schlechterdings. Irgendwie kann das auch nicht sein. Alle, die, die meisten Frauen nehmen den mit ins Bett. Das kann doch nicht sein, dass das der Hauptunterdrücker ist. Ist es das Kapital überhaupt oder ist es der Staat, der dieses alles macht? Und dann weg darüber, die Felder. Sexualität, Familie, lange, lange Diskussion, ist es nicht die Familie? Die, Mar die, die Marginalisierung der Frauen, die, das Zurückdrängen an den Rand der Gesellschaft, die Ausschließungen aus allen möglichen Bereichen, wie kommen wir irgendwie auf einen grünen Zweig? Und dann kam irgendwoher die Revolutionäre, die Idee über Herbert und Butler gänzlich auf Geschlecht zu verzichten. Also nicht nur das Gender zu nennen, sondern auch ganz darauf zu verzichten und unsere Theorien so zu bauen, dass Geschlecht gar keine Rolle mehr spielt. Das ist auch radikal, auch radikal und revolutionär irgendwie. Bloß aber wir werden auch immer sprachloser in diesem gesamten Prozess. Es ist irgendwie auch unbefriedigend. Bis nicht ich alleine, sondern durch das ständige Studium aller dieser Schriften, das ist unheimlich viel, ich habe bestimmt 100 solche Bücher gelesen und verarbeitet in diesem Artikel zu Geschlechterverhältnissen, die, der dann hier auch abgedruckt ist, kommen alle vor, wie sie auch richtig gesagt hat, es kommen immer zu, alle vor und ihr könnt sie wiederzufinden, dass es nicht günstig ist, es ist günstig von Geschlechterverhältnissen zu sprechen, statt von Geschlecht. 
Aber irgendwie kommen wir dort immer noch nicht zur Rande, weil das Eigentliche, worüber wir sprechen sollten, sind die Produktionsverhältnisse. Und wenn man dieses erst plötzlich blitzhaft gefunden hat, sagt natürlich, wir müssen Produktionsverhältnisse und diese unglaublich wichtige Analyse derselben nicht dem männlichen Mainstream-Marxismus oder dem Arbeiterbewegungsmarxismus überlassen, sondern die Geschlechterverhältnisse sind Produktionsverhältnisse, weil es geht gar nicht nur um eine Produktion, sondern um zwei, darüber habe ich heute Morgen gesprochen, Leben und Lebensmittel, die aufeinander angewiesen sind und jetzt sich gegeneinander verselbstständigen. Aus dem einen wird Profit gezogen, das zweite wird nebensächlich beiseite getan, aber dennoch bleiben sie immer zusammen und wir haben also Geschlechterverhältnisse als Produktionsverhältnisse. Damit tun wir was ganz Unverschämtes, jetzt werden wir richtig unbescheiden, sind ja, denn wir haben die Produktionsverhältnisse aus diesen Fängen, in denen sie als der bedeutende Kern marxistisch-kritisch-politisch-ökonomischer Analyse stehen, in den Feminismus gezogen und sagen so, und wir machen, bauen das jetzt um, gestalten das um, Leben und Lebensmittel. Und wenn wir das erst gemacht haben, kommen wir unheimlich viel weiter. Wir sehen nämlich jetzt, was alles vergessen ist und warum das so ist und wie Profit gemacht wird und wo, wie in diesem Projekt Kapitalismus, nenne ich jetzt auch mal Projekt, ähm, die, das Unterflügen der Frauen als Rohstoff geschieht und nichts an der Stelle passiert, was wir nicht tun dass wir also an dieser Stelle eingreifen und also die Produktionsverhältnisse als Begriff für uns reklamieren. Das war dieses Stichwort, das kann man also nachlesen. Das ist, hat im Wesentlichen die Diskussion auf diesem gesamten Feld innerhalb des Feminismus und ist natürlich äh, wesentlich der angloamerikanische Feminismus mit etwas Französischem da drin und etwas Italienischem da drin, aber im Wesentlichen ist es schon so und das ist nicht, weil wir so bösartig sind und blind oder gar rassistisch, sondern weil wir nicht mehr Sprachen beherrschen und weil wir das Geld nicht haben, immer um den Globus zu reisen und überall in den anderen Sprachen auch Untersuchungen zu machen und das anzureichern. Eigentlich, eigentlich müsste man das, aber beschränken wir uns zunächst auf das, was wir können und das haben wir dann da drin getan. Das ist das eine. Das zweite Stichwort was ich da drin habe, ist das, was The Marx with in Feminism heißt. Das habe ich geschrieben nach der feministischen Abkehr von Marx und Marxismus, die unglaublich stark besonders in der Bundesrepublik Deutschland war. Ich habe eine Zeit gehabt, wo ich verzweifelt auch nur eine einzige Person suchte, die von sich sagte, sie sei marxistisch und feministisch zugleich. Die Entweder sie wollten vom Feminismus nichts wissen, das waren die Marxistinnen, oder sie wollten vom Marxismus nichts wissen, das waren die Feministinnen. Und ich war plötzlich vollständig allein. Ein ganz abscheuliches Gefühl. Die einzige marxistische, feministische, marxistische Feministin, die versucht, irgendetwas zu bewegen. Neben vielem anderen, was ich dann in dem Buch, was wir am Sonntag vorstellen, gemacht habe, habe ich für diesen Text, der hier drin ist, gedacht, wir müssen eigentlich noch einmal zurück zu Marx und sehen, ob er wirklich genauso abscheulich geschrieben hat, wie die feministische Analyse über ihn spricht, nämlich einen männlichen Arbeitsbegriff, überhaupt nur Lohnarbeit im Zentrum und sonst gar nichts analysiert, die Frauentätigkeiten vergessen oder gar die Frauenunterdrückung da drin verdoppelt und was man sonst noch alles sagen kann, ist denn das so mit Marx? Und habe auf drei Ebenen versucht zu sehen, wie man doch mit Marx ganz anders arbeiten muss und kann. Und die eine Ebene ist diese Frage mit dem Arbeitsbegriff. Wenn man Marx nachliest, wird man jetzt ganz kurz, ganz schnell sehen, das ist überhaupt nicht seine Idee von Arbeit. Dass sie von Natur aus Lohnarbeit ist und eigentlich solche, solche die nur in die männliche Arbeiterklasse gehört und in den Klassenkampf, sondern Arbeit ist sinnlich-menschliche Tätigkeit. Praxis. Darin gehört, dann kann man das alles mal raussuchen, was hat er alles da drin? Das kennt ihr auch irgendwoher, entfremdete Arbeit, was ist denn das? Da wird, werden die Menschen ihrer, ihres eigenen Wesens entfremdet, treten einander gegenüber wie Dinge oder wie Waren, 
Es gibt laut, lauter Bezüge von uns und das geht so weit, dass der Transgen sich in der Liebe bestätigt wissen wird, auch in den Arbeitsbegriff. Und all dieses soll befreit werden, wenn wir uns transformativ und revolutionär betätigen. Das fand ich war alles in, die, in das Lehrbuch für die jungen Feministinnen zu schreiben. Was ist denn das eigentlich alles, was verkehrt wurde durch kapitalistische Entfremdung von Arbeit? Das ist der eine Teil. Der zweite Teil, den ich nachdrücklich Feministinnen empfehle, ist die, sind die Feuerbach-Thesen. Ganz kurz habe ich heute Morgen auch schon gesagt, auszugehen davon, bei allen Analysen von der sinnlich-praktischen Tätigkeit der Menschen, sinnlich-praktisch, kann man ja Frauen gar nicht rauslassen und vergessen, das ist völlig unmöglich, sondern was passiert denn mit diesen sinnlich-praktischen Tätigkeiten? Das geht, geht bis zu diesem Punkt, den ich auch heute Morgen schon gesagt habe, aber es wird dann hoffentlich ganz doll in euren Köpfen bleiben, dass Selbstveränderung und Veränderung der Umstände in revolutionärer Praxis in eins fallen. Das ist ein sehr wichtige, wichtiges Element, was dann dazu führt, zu dem nächsten Satz. Die Menschen, Moment, hoffentlich kriege ich den jetzt zusammen. Ich gucke es nach. Oder ich muss es paraphrasieren. Die Menschen machen ihre Geschichte selbst, wenn auch nicht aus freien Stücken. Da haben wir die Struktur und die Bedingungen, unter denen in gesellschaftlichen Verhältnissen die Menschen ihre Geschichte machen, aber sie machen sie selbst. Luxemburg hat das noch unterstrichen. Marx hat gesagt, die Menschen machen ihre Geschichte selbst, wenn auch nicht aus freien Stücken. Zwei Analysen braucht er jetzt. Luxemburg hat gesagt, nach La Salle, die Menschen machen ihre Geschichte nicht aus freien Stücken, aber sie machen sie selbst. Dieses besonders Feministin zu empfohlen, das heißt, dass wir uns in diese Gesellschaft einarbeiten, selber. Und indem wir das tun, auch um unsere Position in dieser Gesellschaft, an der beteiligt sind, dass wir selbst unsere eigene Unterdrückung produzieren. Ein sehr, ein sehr wichtiges Element, was bei mir dann ausgebaut ist und mit vielen anderen zusammen, das ist, wie Charlotte euch auch schon gesagt hat, ist, ist feministische Forschung, Forschung eigentlich immer kollektive Forschung, weil es, also sie antwortet auf die vielen Fragen aus den Frauengruppen und Bewegungen und kann also gar nicht allein, sondern mit ihnen zusammen sein. Also, so. führt dieses zur Entwicklung der Methode der Erinnerungsarbeit, welche dann ganz Bücherschränke voll. Ich glaube, elf Bücher zur Erinnerungsarbeit habe ich im Laufe der Zeit gemacht, auch in Australien, wo Terry herkommt, in England, in Dänemark, wo viele hier herkommen. Eigentlich in allen Ländern ist Erinnerungsarbeit angekommen und es ist ein Versuch, die, sich der eigenen Geschichte und des eigenen Gewordenseins so zu versichern, dass man hinterher nicht das Opfer der Verhältnisse ist, sondern Täterin der eigenen Geschichte, also sind Selbstermächtigungsversuche. Die anderen Sachen lasse ich jetzt weg. Die dritte, doch das tippe ich euch an, die Hausarbeit, das ist witzigerweise so, dass Marx und Engels oder mindestens Marx tatsächlich über Hausarbeit geschrieben hat und nicht, nicht wie das behauptet wird, die es gibt ganze Kapitel und wenn ihr im Register nachseht, werdet ihr das finden. Nur meinte er unter Hausarbeit, die in den Manufakturen und im Haus verrichtete industrielle Arbeit, wo die dann die Weberaufstände und sowas kommen, wo dann die ganze Familie eingeschleust wird und alle müssen plötzlich diese Arbeit für die ausgelagerte Produktion machen. Das ist Hausarbeit und innerhalb dessen findet ihr einige Elemente, die sehr nützlich sind dass er ansieht, was denn da alles passiert, die schrecklichsten Dinge zum Beispiel. Lernen die Arbeitertöchter kochen in dem Moment, wo nichts mehr zu essen da ist. Und solche Elemente findet ihr schöne kleine Schmuckstücke, die man behalten kann. Aber die zwei Fragen, und man kann die Gedanken schärfen, wenn man das liest über häusliche Arbeit, die er historisch dort aufarbeitet. Das war der dritte Grund, sich Marxens nicht zu entledigen in den Punkten allen gibt noch mehr. Aber Charzat wollte noch wissen, was für einen Umgang 
ich hoffe, die jüngere Generation mit diesem Buch und dann auch mit meinen Kapiteln haben wird. Ich habe ge hab gedacht, dass in dem es zweifelnd geschrieben ist, in dem es die Geschichte von Irrtümern und von auch merkwürdigen Einschätzungen im in Verlauf verfolgt, würde, würden die jüngeren Generationen das Zweifeln lernen, das Nachdenken, die Selbstkritik und die Notwendigkeit, selbst das Ding in die Hand zu nehmen und weiterzuentwickeln. Das hoffte ich, dass das dadurch passiert und also dialektisch denken lernen, also die Dinge in Bewegung sehen und sich da drin, sodass sie sich auch verändern, während man sie liest, verändern sie sich, sie sich schon weil man selber als Lesende da drin vorkommt. Das ist das eine. Und das Buch im Ganzen, ich weiß nicht, Schasat, wir haben natürlich kulturelle Differenzen. Deutschland ist was völlig anderes als die Anglosachsen-Länder, in denen feministischer Marxismus noch eher denkbar ist als bei uns. Deutschland ist immer am Tag der Restauration dabei und nicht, wo die Revolution gemacht wird, ne, sondern... Es ist völlig unmöglich, in diesem Land wirklich marxistisch-feministisch zu sein. Das, ihr versucht das jetzt alle. Ne? Nach diesem Kongress versucht ihr, das, das voranzutreiben. Aber dennoch dachte ich, das Buch würde insgesamt ermutigen, im postmarxistischen Gesamt Marx nicht einfach auf den Müllhaufen der Geschichte zu werfen, sondern seine weit über die Lohnarbeitsfrage hinausgehenden Schätze sich anzusehen und zu bergen und für uns zu erarbeiten und immer weiterzuführen. Es gibt keinen Größeren in Bezug auf die Theorie der kapitalistischen Gesellschaft als ihn. Und da wir da drin leben, sollten wir das nutzen. Du hast noch zehn Minuten. Wenn die anderen nicht gefragt werden. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia and, and Frieger. I think that with all the promises from skepticism to not having Marxist feminist struggle in Germany, you really would like to read the book and then see that what, what we, can, we can do and then especially that looking, uh, you know, the, the examples that uh, Cynthia in, in terms of, of, of the struggle in, in Turkey that she um, cited here is extreme, extremely important as a scholar and activist of, of the uh, Middle East and North Africa region, I can tell you that my hope in, in terms of, of, of the, of the uh, struggle of women, um, that it is not only uh, emancipation for women in, in that region, but has a global reach, is uh, within that struggle. So that is a very important uh, region uh, to, to look at. Uh, let me read um, very briefly as a way of, of concluding this part of, of, of the program um, a statement that I, I asked all the uh, contributors to just send me some of their reflections. I, I have um, statements from other authors, but because of time, I limit myself to Theresa Ebert's statement as she wrote the epilogue for, for the book. So she says, Marxist feminism, whose name could not be uttered during the years of the triumph of neoliberal capitalism, was re-signified by such reformist names as materialist feminism, trivialized through the bourgeois metaphors of unhappy marriage and dispersed in the rituals of the performativity of gender. Now, after the capitalist crisis of 2007-2008, Marxist feminism has emerged as the revolutionary theory of feminism without borders. This revolutionary theory without which, as Lenin has said again and again, there can be no revolutionary movement, is grounded in the dialectic of class and gender. It is a revolution to end all class relations and eradicate the exploitation of gender and sexuality by capital to increase the rate of surplus labor. 
the bourgeois social theory popularized by Anthony Negri and some feminists in the global north has abandoned the dialectic and in the name of multitude displaced international class struggle by class composition in the empire. While many progressive feminists delight in the Deleuzian body without organs and find in deterioration a way forward, the everyday life of women in the South is fashioned by the digital territorialism of economic imperialism. Gender and sexuality have been turned into political issues that obscure their economic ontology. The new Marxist feminism activist uh, Marx called as now a call to feminists all over the world to abandon their illusions about their condition. The illusion that their situation can be transformed within capitalism. It's a call to abandon a condition which requires illusions and join the revolution to end class relations so that for the first time in human history, people can be free from religion, family, state, and return to their human, that is, social mode of existence. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, please do engage with the book, read it, tear it apart, and, and, and in, a, in a very dialectical way, as, as, it, as you read it and finish it, start a new one. Thank you very much. It looks like this. Very modest almost like hiding itself, isn't it? Shazad, it's hiding itself. Some people are asking where, where you can get the book. The book is, 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 is outside. We had, uh, we had no intention of producing a sort of a pale, something that appears, as Frigga said, as, as modest book. It was, as, as Frigga and, and Cynthia can attest to, this was a big battle with Z Press. Z had this design, and, and then in the middle, it was all sewing machines. And we fought with them, and it was in a very last, very, very last moment of producing the book, that after intervention from Frigga, Cynthia, and many other authors, we forced them to remove the sewing machines. <laughs> they insisted. <laughs> so when you, when you get this book, send a message to Z Press and, and tell them that why this important book it looks so pale. <laughs>